and action. What do we have next, Matt? Well, we have a question. Actually, it's a story from somebody. I'm not going to include their name um, because it's a little bit. Well, you'll just see. So this person says, I had an insured contact me through text message and ask me to yank the shingles off the roof before my adjuster gets here. He thought that I was his contractor. And when I got out there, it was pretty apparent that some of the damage was new. How do you handle a situation like that with the insured? Or how do you handle that situation in general? Oh, you're asking me? Well, I mean, I can start that one, certainly. Well, since you got ideas, well, I would have fun with it. You know me, (laughs) but let's hear the proper way to do it first. So I think when we we could talk about fraud in general, if if we encounter encounter something in the field that were like, oh, this is definitely not storm damage. Um, And the thing about it is, is that right off the bat, I will say that it's not common don't see it very often in all the claims that I've, I've run over the years. It's maybe a few dozen times out of like over 10,000 claims is, is somebody you're seeing something that you're like, okay, this is not, this storm didn't do this. Somebody did this. It doesn't right. look like what you normally see on a roof and it doesn't take long. It doesn't take a whole lot of experience. You know, a couple of hail storms. You're looking at a lot of roofs. You're looking at several dozen or a few hundred roofs. You start to to recognize footfalls. You start to recognize bird poop and moss and all that blisters. Kind of, blister, yeah, blister, all that kind of stuff that's on on shingles, granular loss, just because right. it's old or it's a it's a poorly manufactured shingle, whatever. You see hail when you when it, and a, usually when a cat adjuster gets a, a, uh, deployed to a hailstorm, it's because there's hail damage there. Right. So we know what we're theoretically we're supposed to know what hail damage looks like because usually when we're there. It's there and we see it and we're like, oh, yep, this is hail damage. All right. Right. So when you see something that doesn't conform to either what hail damage is or what is just normal wear and tear or like shingle characteristics, it pops out. Right. <clears throat> if somebody like you were talking about, you know, with the, the ball peen hammer on the, the car. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, it's the paint right. chipped in the same spot. Same thing happens to shingle. Or siding, right? If you take a ball peen hammer and you think, well, it's round, I mean, that's, you know, mm-hmm. and you smash it into a shingle, ice isn't going to pa- make the, the, the granules into powder, right? It's not going to, it's not going right. to crush them. It's just going to knock them loose, right? Because it's, it's ice, right? It's not harder than the granule. So when you get up on a, on a roof and you see a bunch of like exactly same shaped, you know, little indentations, with you can tell the character of the what was on the ball peen hammer if there was a scratch on it that's going to show up in the hole right there's a dent that they made with the the hammer every single little spot that you see looks exactly the same just like that truck and it's going to powder the shing, the granules into little into dust right. right and on top of that they're not going to be close to the edges and they're going to be in a uniform like the guys you know walk across the roof in, in a line and just make right in the middle of every single tab Right. Which well, they'll stand in one place and they'll make an arc. Oh, I'll forget about where they're standing at. Right. <laughs> so it's like this brush pretty little rainbow. <laughs> hail falls totally randomly out of the sky. So it's going to have a random pattern on the roof. Right. So when you see that kind of thing, it pops out. Right. Or, or when people grab shingles and rip them off. Right. Wind doesn't grab, tear a shingle in half, like a tab or, or even like a, a laminated shingle and rip it into half and like tear off, tear off the piece of it right? Mm-hmm. It's going to just blow them away. They're going to be gone, right? I've had, I've gone out and looked at them where there's pieces, the pieces that they were ripped off are laying next to where they were ripped off. The wind was strong enough to blow the shingle up that way. They'd be long gone right. in somebody else's yard. So all I have to say that it's, hey, fraud's obvious most of the time. If I've ever been fooled by fraud, I have no idea. If somebody was that good that they mm-hmm. could, but you know, 99% of the time, literally more than I would say even 99% of the time, you're not seeing it. It's not common. But 
Sometimes you do, right? And so what do you do when that happens? So in this case, he got a heads up from the insured accidentally sending the contractor a text message, sending it to the adjuster instead of to the, to the contractor saying, don't forget to, you know, don't forget to trash my roof before the adjuster gets there. Right. I'm probably going to call my manager as soon as I get that text and say, hey, listen, I just got a, an accidental text from the insured saying to the contractor, yank the shingles off the roof. And I'm going to screenshot it and everything. And I'll, I'll send that over to them. What do I do? Right. And chances are what they'll have you do is they will have you, they'll send you, send you out anyway. Um, and get all the photos that you need to get. And then they'll refer it to SIU probably. Right. Um, you could theoretically go out there and say, listen, I got this text message. You meant obviously didn't mean to send this to me. Do you want to withdraw your claim? You have a, mul a mulligan on it. All right. I mean, theoretically you could do that and then let's just forget the whole thing. Um, However, in that scenario, if there was, actual damage to the roof and right. it was just additional damage you still owe for the existing damage if they want to pursue the claim right so right so but the, if the, the house same, burns down and right. they don't want to file a claim they don't i mean right. the, the bank will make them file a claim right. in that case but so in, in that case and that happens right like you said with the truck again i see i've seen it in the past where somebody goes up on the roof and with a quarter or a half dollar or you know who knows what golf shoe and they, they make a bunch of damage to the roof. And it's already got real hail damage to it. I could have easily totaled the roof, right, without them doing without them even touching it. And when, when that happens, I'm totaling the roof and I'm just, I'm just ignoring what I saw. Unless mm -hmm. I see it again, right? And what I'll usually say is if the contractor's there, which 99% of that time, those times, he's not. Because he knows that he doesn't want to stand there and get busted in person. Um, if he's there, which occasionally he is, and I'm, I'll, I'll pull him aside and say, listen, um, this roof has hail damage all over it, and, and we're going to take care of it and replace it, no problem. But there's also some other things on this roof that I know weren't caused by the storm or by wear and tear or anything else. If I see that again associated with your company or you, if your name is on a file and I get up on a roof and I, I see this, then I'm going to have to take a lot of pictures and send it up. Oh. Right. Just saying. And usually the guy's sweating is, you know, he's, you know, yeah. Okay. I, mean, I, don't know what, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I mean yeah. Okay. Right. And so, um, I will play with those guys a little bit as well. Right. Like the, the guy that, that makes the test square. And again, it's it's usually on a roof that's already got hail damage, that's already totaled, that's easily totalable without anybody looking at it as right. it lies. Makes a test square right in the middle of the slope, and then I don't know what they're using if they're using their finger or what, and they just like rub on spots. And it's all, there's 15 of them in this this square. You know, our north slope equals 15 plus. You know, and the only place that those blacks, I mean, they're jet black, like somebody rubbed something. Right. They're only inside the test square. And I'm like, listen, dude, <laughs> what is this? What is that? What is, and I'll be, I'll be like, I'll look at him. Like, what am I looking at here? What is this spot? Uh, that's hell, dude. Well, I mean, I, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's hail damage, man. I mean, have you never seen it before? Why isn't it out here? If I have enough room to do How my own test square, job? I do my own test square. I'm like, why are none of those in here? And I'll just start interrogating the guy. Just like, that's why people don't like insurance companies. A guy like you that want to deny claims. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you ever met a you ever met a roofer with a really calloused thumb? Yeah, all yeah, of them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> pushing them down, pushing them down. Exactly. So, I how I would handle that is just like you. I would just go to my manager and say, "Hey, I received this. How do you want me to proceed?" Yeah. And and that's just basically CYA. That's just covering your tail. You know, you've let your manager know. They've let you know how they want you to proceed. And and there's nothing, yep. you know, there's there's nothing left for interpretation. That's it. But that won't stop me from having a little fun once I get to the house if I'm told to go ahead and go out and inspect it. You know? Are you an insurance adjuster? Then you need insurance adjuster. 
If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. I really think you should get both of them. It doesn't matter if you're a W-2 or 1099 or work carrier direct. Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the Insurance for Adjusters free guide, go to cplic.net slash adjustertv. You know, I mean, I'll, yeah. I'd be like, oh, by the way, I got your text. Uh, okay, just got through looking at your roof. I'm going to get this written up, get it turned in, and uh, and we'll get you uh, an estimate over here in just a minute. And uh, just want to let you know, I did get your text that is a part of this claim as well. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Wait, whoa, 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 what? what? And, uh, and it's a, you know, we'll be back with you. And I, and I would just walk off with it, just let them sweat it out and, and move on. And just let the people on a higher pay grade than me, make the decision from there, yeah. you know, as to what to do. One thing that, that happens sometimes <clears throat> is that you'll go to an insurance house and there's no contractor or they're, they're, they had a contractor, but he's not there at the meeting. You know, you get the old, yeah, mm. just go on and take a look at it and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you get up on the roof and there's no other damage except for shingles, hammer hits, yeah, hammer or hits. there's, you know, there's, it's, for, it's something's there's manufactured damage or mechanical whatever you want to call it um i've talked to some guys who are like man i go now i tell the insured you know you better file a vandalism claim and blah blah and they'll say all these things i'm still not going to do that i will i will ask the insured i'll say listen who all was up on your roof oh well just the one just the young, one young man was here and you know and and they, they came by in the evening on Sunday because there was the storm was on Saturday and, da, 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 and they, they were up on the roof for a little while. And they came down and they showed me pictures of my roof. And, and uh, you know, they said to just call them back after after you guys look at it and so on and so forth. I'm going to say. OK, and then I will say thank you very much. I have everything that I need. I've got all the photos and everything uh, myself or somebody will be in touch and we'll uh We'll, we'll go from there. If you have any questions or anything, give me a call. Here's my car. Da, 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 da. Um, that's all I'm saying. I'm not going to, I'm not going to handicap or hamstring the carrier and whatever it is that they want to do mm -hmm. by making statements to the insurer yep. that could come back up later. So then I will go and I'll call my manager and I'll say, Hey, listen, I found, I took a ton of pictures. I found one. I think it looks like somebody got up there with a hammer and whatever. Um, they hand it off to SIU or they hand it off to the carrier and the carrier will decide what to do with it, right? The carrier will likely bring SIU out, probably pay for the claim, certainly pay for the claim under vandalism or, you know, or something like that and take care of the homeowner and then start doing their little investigation stuff right. on whoever the contractor was. Make sure you get the contractor's name and phone number and anybody that was, whoever was at the house, get that, all that contact information put it in the file and just write it up as no hail damage found. Right. Cause that's a fact. You right. didn't find any hail damage. If your manager says to, to write up something different in there, cause you're going to call them before you write the activity diary or the GLR or whatever, then do what they tell you to do. Right. So you are like, you're just a set of eyes, right? It's not, we're not, we're not lawyers. We're I found not, OTH other than hail. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's, there's photos of, um, some marks on the roof that are not consistent with hail damage. Um, that are widespread over the roof photos and the, you know, whatever. And so there's, mm -hmm. and there's, I'm going to take a hundred photos on that roof. Whereas if it had real hail damage and I might, I might've taken 30 photos. Right. Um, so I think that's, I think that's the safest thing to do because it, it gives the carrier the most options to take because the homeowner might not have a clue, right? right? They might not. You, know. you have to be careful making that accusation, right? You know, yeah. and, and even implying that to exactly. a homeowner again, a, they may not know. Yep. Okay. B, you know, you might be wrong. You might be wrong, you know, yeah. and see that's, you know, if you are wrong and you upset that homeowner enough, oh, you know, the next thing you know, you got a lawyer calling you, oh, you yeah. know, you want to find your way in a court real fast. Yeah. So don't, don't take it upon yourself to make that decision to, to use the fraud word to them or yeah. manufactured no. or anything like that. No. I used the example before about, you know, the beat up Yukon where the guy beat it with a ball peen hammer. You know, never once did I ever say to that guy, um, this is not hail. You know, I just said, I'm going to work up my estimates. This is next steps. And, uh, and then, so, 
Uh, I'll be setting this up for somebody to look at, and they'll be back in contact with you. And I just left it at that, you know. Yeah. And uh, well, I'll get it repaired right with well, somebody. I'll be in contact with you. Yeah. You I know? mean, you're tweaking them a little bit, but you, so, you were, it was nothing that like if it came up in court, they're going to say. Did you accuse me of this? Said or, so yeah. and such and such. You got to so, be very careful how you handle that. Yeah. A long, a long story short, best practice. In any case where you you suspect there's fraud, whether it's because you got a, a, a inadvertent text or you see something, is to, to call your manager and just say, mm -hmm. "Listen, this is this is what I'm seeing, or this is what I whatever. What do I do?" Because one of your prime jobs, I think, as an insurance adjuster, as a field adjuster, is to keep your manager's phone from ringing. One of his or her prime jobs is to keep the carrier's manager's phones from ringing. Yep. So if you start causing trouble by accusing people of fraud or by telling them they got a vandalism claim or, you know, whatever it is, or saying there's a roofer running around, I mean, you're going to, it causes phones to explode everywhere. And it's the last thing that they want to do. If you give them all the options, then it's, they'll perceive you as a professional. And they can say this, you know, he was discreet, made the right call, um, didn't make the right call, but he still called us first. And he was, he was suspected that what he saw wasn't real hail damage, but we sent a guy out, SIU went out, looked at it, or QA went out and looked at it before they sent it to SIU. QA said, they think it's hail damage, they're gonna, no problem, just go ahead and take care of it, right? If you go out and you, you, you don't know, if you're, not, if you're a newbie, if you don't have that much experience with hail, uh, some staff adjusters don't have a lot of experience with hail because they only do mostly water claims or wind claims mm -hmm. or whatever, and they don't get on a lot of roofs. Um, and you, and you see something that doesn't look like what you think it's supposed to look like, involve your manager first before you start going saying anything to anybody else. And that's the safest thing to do. And again, like I said, probably five times now, it gives them the most options to handle it the way they want to handle it, which is you're there at their pleasure to serve them right, right. In, in this whole thing. So that's what I would say to do in that case. Um, so... That's a good question, though, because yep. fraud's fraud's a thing. And again, like I said, it's not as common as you would you would suspect, because um, generally speaking, when you get called out as a cat adjuster, there was a there was a catastrophe, right? Fire, you know, yep. windstorm, and St. Louis or something like that, and the big old trees are falling over. Um, you can't it's, you can't. It's hard to make up fraud for that. Where you see fraud a little bit more often is when you're like as a staff adjuster. I saw it probably more in a year as a staff adjuster than I did in like five years as a cat adjuster, and I handle a fraction of the claims. Um, is when people want to claim something twice, right? So they had, they just they're they've only been with the company for a year, and you you can pull up, which I didn't know until I started working as a staff adjuster. You could pull up. For any address or any person's name, all the claims that have ever been at that address or that. No matter been, who the carrier is. No matter who the carrier is yep. at all. Right. So you, and you know this. So you can, if somebody says, you have to pull the priors on every single one of your your staff claims, all of them. If there's priors, you have to, or and if, even if there's not priors, you still have to do an ISO search and look them up. Right. Right. And if you go to the insurance house and do you, I see, I had, which one of them I had photos before photos before and it looked exactly the same like they just went and grabbed some shingles and well we had some wind damage on the roof and they were just the shingles are like teepeed right like they were just they fluffed them and they just kind of like fell back down and were sort of leaning on each other like this three years ago and they were still there just like that i was like <laughs> from the photos i was like what so i told the insurer i said listen uh it looks like you've already been paid for this because they were the homeowner before they had a different right. company and i was able to get that the photos and the guy like yelled something at me and got all mad and hung up. And that was the last I heard from him. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, you just, I mean, what, what is this? Like, it's not an ATM service. Yep. You know I mean? Come on. Or they get upset with you whenever they didn't get the previous roof replaced. Oh, right, right, right. You know, and so now you have. Well, he got money for it, yeah. And he got, you know, they, they got paid to replace the roof. They didn't replace the roof. Now it's time to replace the roof again. Or they get another hellstorm comes through. You come through it and you're going, well, yeah, there's damage up there, but however, we already paid you for a roof to get replaced. So once you get that roof replaced, then uh, we might be able to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's nothing we can do for you. We've already paid for it. You're not replacing it. So yeah. uh, not going to pay for a roof we've already paid for once. No. And that happened. In, you know, and unfortunately, I I saw that a lot because I was in an area that was um, 
work in an area that the not not a lot of income. You know, people really couldn't even afford their deductibles. Right. You know, and there were there were smaller houses with high deductibles, and here it is. You know, they're facing it again, and seeing the same story again. Yeah. And now they're probably not going to get coverage. They're probably going to get the coverage canceled now. Yeah. You know, so it's you see it. Um, was there another part of that question? Uh, I don't think so. I actually had talking about uh, not paying for something more than once. Yep. I had a a guy. It was and it was a good hearted, you know, good natured debate who is a doctor and a presumably an educated person who argued with me on that he's like well what do you mean and he was like i was like listen you know we paid for the it was just the gutters it was something dumb small and for like 30 minutes we we're like going back and forth on it yep. i'm like he just felt his own he was entitled to just get paid for it over and over again my insurance pays me for damage it doesn't matter what a damn it, you know, it's on and on. I was like, okay, well your policy actually, you know, well, does it say that somewhere in there? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm like looking in the policy. So, so if you totaled your car and they paid you for your car and you kept your car for whatever reason, and you were transporting that car on a trailer and it falls off the trailer. So they pay you to total that car a second time. No, why would I don't think so. But it's damaged again. <laughs> Come on. Right. It's all right. What's this next one here? I just thought. They hadn't canceled the policy yet. Here we go. Jason McHenry. Hello, Jason McHenry. Mr. McHenry. He says, can you talk about how to prepare and equip when called on a cat that's a few hundred miles away by flight? few hundred miles away by flight. So um, we all have different boundaries <laughs> on this. Um, I am not, I probably won't take something that I have to fly to. That's just me, you know, um, just because what am I going to do for a car when I get there? Right. You know, renting a car, you know, the, the cost expensive. of that is expensive. Uh, you have liabilities about that car, you know, you have to take the damage waivers out, which makes it even more expensive or you're trying to cover under your insurance or whatever. It, to me, if I have to fly to it, me personally, probably not going to do it, but there is probably a, a caveat to every situation, yeah. you know, depending on how it's, how it's arranged. Like, you know, you can take a on property. Yeah. I've got too much gear, too many things I need to take with me. I want my car. You know, yeah. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to fly to that. Now, if it's for auto, not the same requirements uh, for auto. A lot of times with auto, you're going to a single location where people are coming to you. But even if you do get fuel claims, uh, you don't have to have that much equipment. If it's paying well enough that you can rent a car, then yeah, do it. I got offered one. I didn't do it, but uh, I know other guys that did that. They actually went to Mexico. And uh, to to do hell claims in Mexico, and they were shuffled to and from the hotel to a place where they were bringing the cars to them, you know, and and they were just working basically a tunnel. Um, and then I did one in Virginia this year where you know we went out and it was a dealership, the dealership group, and we went out and uh, reevaluated all the hell damage after another company had already come out and done it, you know. And I flew there, but I was in one place, you right. know, the whole time. So it, it it's different. But for me, if it's property, I just don't, you know, I mean, I hear about people going to New York City. I hear, you know, certain states like, you know, I think it's New Jersey's one of them. If you put a ladder on top of it, you're automatically a commercial vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so you have different rules on that, you know. Yeah, Long just, Island. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It, I don't have enough experience on that, but I don't know. I just wouldn't do it personally. Well, and I think it kind of falls under that other question that we had. Um, I don't think I would want to drive a thousand miles of scope for just a week or two. So there's some considerations. I have known people. I knew of a guy who lived in England and he worked cat here. And so when there was a cat, he would jump on a plane, fly over, rent a car and do cat. Same thing for there was a guy that lived in Alaska, did the same thing. I've also known of a guy that lived in Alaska who drove down when, when there was at the beginning of cat se storm season and did cat. You know, I take it back. I actually know a guy that lives in Puerto Rico. It yeah. does 
as a property here in the U.S. You can't drive from Puerto Rico. Yeah. So I think in, in those cases, like I, I will say I've driven from one coast to the other in a year easily, like and literally not just like in racking up right. miles. Um, your vehicle's your office, right? You're carrying a bunch of stuff around with you. Having a rental car um, or, or a rental, like a pickup truck or something like that that gets expensive. If I was going to go, I would only consider doing that if I was going to go, um, if I knew it was going to be a short storm and it was just, it would take me three days to get to drive there if it's on the exact opposite corner. Like if it was in right. the Keys or something, right? It's, it's a three and a half, four day drive from here to go work 10 days and then turn around and drive back. I might fly down there and, and do that because a, a rental car for a week is 275 bucks or whatever. Right. It's cheaper. Um, and then buy a ladder or rent a ladder. I've rented ladders before. I ran in a 40 foot ladder in New Jersey one time. There you go. So it's, it's, I think it's, well, anyway, so, but the other thing you got to think about is, is that especially if it's at the, at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the season is that a lot of times the storms overlap, right? So if I, let's say I live in, Let's say I live in Denver and there's a, st there's a storm in Atlanta, right? So that's a pretty good drive, right? And if I've decided to fly to Atlanta to do a windstorm and it's April 29th, uh, there's a good chance that there might be a hailstorm in Dallas May 15th, right? So that's two weeks. I'm going to be on CAT in Georgia. It's almost like... It's almost like if it's if it's the beginning of the year, I would never consider driving or flying. flying yeah. I would I would absolutely drive no matter what because I'm probably gonna we probably have overlapping cats until the end of the year, mm -hmm. right? Or until the end of the season. If it was right now, yeah. right, and there was a an ice storm in Toledo or something like that, I'm absolutely gonna fly because it's too far. Mm -hmm. A and B. I'm probably not going to have to get on any roofs, and if they still have snow on the roofs, I'm not getting on there anyway. Right, right. So I'm just going to I'm just going to need, you know, printer. I could probably fit everything I need in a bag and check it. Right, right? wrap the printer up in towels or whatever, and send it through. It'll probably be a mistake, but um, there'd be a rare occasion where I would consider flying. I've never flown to a cat, ever, not ever once. Right, I've flown home from cat on vacation or like taking a break. Right. Right. So if I'm in California doing wildfires, I want to take the weekend off or take a Sunday through Wednesday or, you know, Tuesday evening off kind of a deal. Absolutely. I'm jumping on a plane. No, nope, no problem. But, um, I think it would be very challenging to make that a habit. Like that's how you run claims like fly and then rent a car. I mean, you could probably think of all different kinds of ways to do it. Like maybe in Kansas city, or Springfield, Missouri, you've got a storage unit with, right. you know, your Trans Am with the light going back and forth on the front of it and a ladder rack on it and you're, all your, everything's in there and you just, you know, you hit the remote and the door opens up and then you drive off and do claims all summer. If you're flying in from Alaska or keeping, keeping a truck at like a, your cousin's place in Kansas or whatever it is and just flying and jumping in your truck and going. Um, but then that truck sits there for the rest of the year and, Nobody's driving it. Well, you know, I did have a situation where I went through basically like Joplin, Missouri area more than once this year. And I left some stuff there. Yeah. Because I knew I was coming back through. Oh, I knew the, I knew got, the chances ladder. of me coming back. Do you mean you know? garages have a ladder that I've left there in them? Okay. You know? From literally from there's one in California. There's one in Minneapolis. There's two in Indiana. Yeah. You know, and I just. One, there's two in, there's one in Kansas and one in Dallas. Ladders. I just told it. I just told the, the hotel. I said, hey. I said, I'm probably going to be back here in a few weeks. I'm going to leave this stuff here, you know. And if for some reason I don't make it back, I'll call you with the instructions on how to ship it to me. They said, not a problem, yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, I was back not even a week later. Yeah. And got my stuff. And that's kind of the, one of the benefits of doing the RV thing. Yep. There's, I mean, it's there's pros and cons and there's, there's challenges both ways. But bec with the RV, at least, it's your own bed. It's your, it's like your, the only thing that changes out the, you know, is the view out the window, right? right? So you've got everything's all set up in there, just exactly the way you want. You got your food, you can cook whenever you want to. You know, RV campgrounds, especially in like 
rural Midwest are dirt cheap. I mean, like shockingly cheap. Um, so you could save a lot of money going that way. But I think that, you know, not to go off on a big tangent about RVs, but if a person says, all right, I'm going to be a cat adjuster. And then they go buy a 40 foot yeah. brand spanking new $89,000 fifth wheel Montana, and, whatever. Yeah. I think that's missing the point. So, and again, we don't want to go off on RVs right now. Uh, the only problem with RVs at this stage of the game is RVs became extremely popular this year because of COVID. Yeah, right. And I only took my RV on two deployments this year out of seven. Yeah. And the main reason was I could not find a place to park it because all the places were taken up on the weekends. I could have a place to park it on Monday, Monday through Thursday, and I had to be out Thursday you know, Thursday afternoon so that the weekenders could come in. Right. And they were so booked. And, and so I just, my RV sat home. That's, that's one of the drawbacks to the RV. And even in the years, not like this, you know, why would I load up RV? It takes longer to get there because you can't, you're not going, if you're going 80 miles an hour with the RV, you're out of your mind. It takes longer to get there. It's, it's way more expensive because especially way more fuel, um, setup time. Set up time. time. Yeah. So if, if you, if you're driving from Dallas to Minneapolis for a one little 10 day storm and you take your RV with you, I think that that's dumb. Yeah. You, you mean you could stay at a $200 a night hotel and still not spend as much money as you would haul on your RV all the way up there. Um, just to turn around and haul it all the way home. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that there's, and again, beginning of the season. Yeah. Heck yeah. I'm taking my RV. We're yeah. going to get, if I'm in, you know, I'm in Montana. I'm if, First storm is in, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm, I'm driving that sucker down there, and yep. then I'm gonna just because kind of uh, if if I have breaks between storms, I've got family in Texas, I got family in Indiana, I got family all over the place. So it's like, you know, I'll just use that as an excuse to visit. Let this be my visit for the year. Christmas, yeah. I'm staying home on PJs, yeah. my feet up next to the fire, right? So, well, I'm RV list now. So, you I, are. I sold mine. Oh. As an adjuster, of all the things that you've got to have, there is really none more important than your state adjuster license, especially your very first one. You're going to need it to do just about everything else. Some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. Adjuster TV has partnered with Adjuster Pro because Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as a claims professional. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now. And the truck that pulled it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you do that? You just because I took it twice this past year. Yeah. All right. So you, you just know, didn't use it. A a I needed something bigger than what I had for really? me. For me, um, just like it a was a bed. No, it, it just it's because a lot because of the type of claims I was doing and the type of work I was doing, I spent a lot of time in my RV actually working in it uh-huh. versus doing everything in the field. So it was a eighteen foot RV with no slide out and very small. And, that's cozy and small you know the hot water heater wasn't that big and you know again it just came down to efficiency time efficiency yeah. and comfort and you know but the other problem you were having was is that places i was going to rv parks weren't cheap right, right okay and i could have stayed in an extended stay by the time you figure in my cost of the rv getting it there and it would have cost me extra to stay in an extended stay it was the same price yeah Okay, yeah. so I mean, when you look at the big picture, do I pre- which do I prefer? I prefer an RV, hundred percent. Yeah. But when it came down to the practical side of it, for me, hotels and for me, I'm not I'm not telling everybody else don't go get one because they're fantastic to have. I wasn't home enough to use them on a personal, you know, for yeah. the, my wife and I to go on a trip or something like that because I was gone working during that time of the year, and then be, you know, it, it just didn't get used very much. So I'd rather somebody else use it than me yep so and, like and a, you know what you know on the on the flip side of that if if somebody is looking for like a a full-time hashtag van life you know full-time rv kind of a deal i think it's a good way to it's a good way to go to do this kind of work and do that because yep. then you're not away from home you got your your family with you or your pets and all your stuff i would say the preferred way to go motorhome 
Yeah, in that case, for motor sure. home, and then flat tow a vehicle behind you or dolly it, whatever. Yep. You know, and not own a house and not rent a house. Yeah, live that would be the way to go. Which is, we've talked about this. My that's my wife and I. Our ultimate goal. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Oh, well, you know, I might have an RV, RV for sale for you. Diesel pusher. That's right. With a fresh pulley on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Mr. William Wright uh, has a few questions, but I wanted to, he had one here that I wanted to kind of dig into. Um, he says, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, I, I got in a little bit of trouble for writing an estimate that closely matched what a roofer's estimate actually came in at. Um, it's just because you're good at your job, man. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's a good and accurate estimate, but I had to tweak the exactimate criteria in order to get something closer to real world costs. So in other words, it sounds like he may have had to deviate from the estimating guidelines uh, or from even from the price list. I don't have any details on that. I'm just kind of making assumptions about this, but it's it brings up a broader question. I think that's good to talk about. Um, he can, goes on and says, a few, final reviewer, of course, didn't appreciate but that got me thinking about how objective the pricing data is in Xactimate and how much the carrier would be charged for estimates that would not require supplements. So he kind of goes, he speculates a little bit about, you know, um, basing how people get paid on whether they have a, a supplement or not, which some companies actually do do that. They'll do a holdback on mm -hmm. your pay. And if it doesn't come back, like they'll hold back 40% or 20% or something like that. And if after a certain period of time, if the claim doesn't come back up for a supplement, then they'll send you the rest of that. Personally, I don't, I think that that's the idea behind that kind of makes sense from like the carrier standpoint. So what, if you get a supplement, they're going to go release they're not gonna you. are going to pay you. Yeah. Right. They'll, just, they'll just keep it and, because apparently you didn't do your job correctly the first time. I, I don't, I'm not into that. I don't personally. agree with that. Um, so, um, sometimes things are there that you don't see or that's you can't, right. or that's you exactly can't see. Right. So then it's, then it's, it gets subjective, right? So I think, you know, with this question, I kind of want to touch on pricing data and Xactimate, um, getting a negotiated price with a contractor and then like what to do when you, you have to deviate from the estimating guidelines, you know, it's not what you pay. It's what you say. It's not what you pay. It's, you know, we've talked about this. So, um, Xactimate pricing is, um, it's again, and we touched on this before, but it's, it's something that Simbilly, SimSol, I mean, all these companies, they, 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 de part of their, their business is developing and maintaining a price database, right? For every zip code or every area or whatever in the, in the country. Um, and they, they will get with contractors on this, Right. And, and the materials, manufacturers and distributors and the cost of fuel and all, everything goes into this to figure out the price of a square shingles, right? Um, a lot of contractors use Xactimate. A lot of contractors use Xactimate. And it's the same pricing. They don't have a different price database. Right. So when you when you crack open Xactimate and you want to have a, care, a contractor profile and you want to write an estimate in Wiley, Texas at such and such zip code, it's gonna you're gonna download that price database. You're not gonna get a special contractor where right. it's higher, right? Where where the price differences may come in are gonna be on measurements. It's gonna be on having all of the things, the same things in the estimate, right? So if the pricing's the same, but I don't have drip edge on my estimate, he's got drip edge on his, or the ridge cap or starter or whatever it is, then the prices are gonna be different. So we have to talk about those things, right? And it may be like in this case, you know, again, there's no specific example in here, but if I write an estimate and the, my estimating guidelines say that I can't, that the, the stance of the carrier is that starter strip and re regular ridge cap is included in waste, and I could just hear the comments blowing up right now. <laughs> and so we're not breaking out, we're not adding line items for starter and ridge, then that's what I have to constrain my estimate to. I can't just because some contractor makes some compelling est or uh, argument about it saying, well, you know, you actually should, I can't just do it just because right. he says so. Right. Cause there'd be another contractor that'll do it for whatever it is guaranteed. I've written thousands of estimates by the estimating guidelines and very few of them come back for supplements. Right. And, and a lot of times it's because I have the contractor there and it may be that we, if I can't pay for that, 
I can pay for something else somewhere else where I have a little bit less, yep. you know, less constraint. Right. So you, this is part of the negotiating process. Right. So the con, the, the, if the carrier, um, if you're writing an estimate and you've got an agreed scope and pricing with the contractor and everybody's happy and you're within the, the bounds of the estimating guidelines and the policy and you're not adding a bunch of pie in the sky stuff and that it shouldn't be in there. Carrier's not going to blink. They're not even going to, they won't say a word. They'll be ecstatic, right? This is going to increase your standing, especially when Q, you, you, this file gets QA'd and QA says, this is how I would have written this estimate. He got an agreed scope and pricing. We, you know, we appreciate that because that saves us time and money and everything else on the back end. You know, A plus, right? You're not going to get in trouble for that. If you, and again, we talked about this, it's not what you pay, it's what you say. If I deviate from the estimating guidelines for some reason, and I put the reason in the activity diary or in the GLR and the documentation of the file, also on any photos that are associated with that deviation and explain why, and if it's reasonable, and if it's not like I'm just making something up just to have something in there, just right. to say something, still not gonna be a problem. The only, the, the times, and I said this again before, times I get in trouble is if I miss something. I get QA will call me and say, Hey Matt, you know, everything looks good. You missed, you know, there was nine feet of metal awning on the back of the house. It had, I found some dents on it, you know, and that's, that's 1500 bucks or whatever. It's expensive, right? Put that in the, you know, you need to supplement the assessment, call the insured and rewrap it up. Right. Um, so I, I think that all things being equal, you're not going to have problems sticking with the estimating guidelines and the policy if you write the right the proper estimate right if you didn't leave things out if you if you didn't miss a measurement and a lot of times when people go out and they take photos and then they get estimates and they write their scope sheet or whatever and then they take it back to the hotel room and they don't do that claim for two days and they missed a measurement on something like if ah, i forgot to get the, the that offset you mm -hmm. know or that ridge or that valley or whatever it is they're going to make it up they're not driving back out to right. get that measurement and then contractor then it, then it becomes a thing. It, this, yeah. this is where the difference in the price was. And then you got a supplement. I tell everybody, and this is how I do it, I'm writing them up on site 99.99% of the time um, to, just to avoid that, right? And, and I, want, I want the contractor to be there. I want to like, we, I, so many times, um, here's my truck, here's his truck, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to write this one up. Wait, what? You are? Okay, cool. Well, I'll just be in my truck. I'll get some phone calls, right? It'll take me 20 minutes. I write it up, print it out, come back over, and he guy's sitting there and he's like, "Okay, Bob, listen, I gotta let you go, bro." Hand him my my, you know, estimate with the grand total on it. He takes a look at it. And he says, "Yeah, we can do all that for that." There's my agreed scope and pricing right, right. there. Right, as long as we did that scope together and we wrote down everything, I wrote down everything he was concerned about. You know, we maybe we did talk about starter and ridge, but was there also access issues? You can't get on the, the house from the front. Right, you got to go around the back. I can add some money for that, right? I got him to where he needed to be, 14950 He's happy with it. The customer's happy because there's a signed contract. There's a We're moving yep. down the road. I'm going to get my roof done before everybody else does. I'm yep. not going to... The, the two things that that everybody is... If the conventional wisdom thing with, with insurance companies is, is that they don't want to pay or they're, they're tight-fisted or whatever, and that they want to drag out the process. Two things that I can tell you... It's not true. Absolutely not true, especially the second one. I did not want to drag out the process at no, all. You want to close and done. Close and done. Close and done. Close and done. Right. So, if you're writing your estimate properly, and you're get you're meeting with the contractor, and you're you're taking you know their concerns seriously, and you're being professional. I mean, you know, if they're just out in left field. You know, yeah. making stuff up or whatever. You don't. You just you don't you know, take it seriously. I'm a people person. Doesn't like people. <laughs> you know, so I want to get that estimate done right the first time. Yeah. And not come back and see you again. I'm sure you're a lovely, nice person, but that doesn't mean <laughs> I want to see you enough to put you on my Christmas card list. Yeah. You know, just I. I want to be one and done. Love you and leave you, and just be over with. I don't want to come back. I want to close it and see you later. Yep. So. So, yeah, I guess, you know, the question is, and he, and he was kind of um, talking about changing the way we get paid based on supplements and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
the 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 big picture of this all this stuff is that the carriers are always going to make seven or eight percent, no matter what, no matter how many how much they, would maybe with some exceptions. I mean, they can get knocked out of business or they can leave a state because they're like after those hurt a lot of hurricanes, right. some companies will pull out of states, um, but by and large, they set aside money in a loss reserve every year from the mm -hmm. premiums that that come in, and that money goes to pay claims, right. Yep. That's that's why you do a uh, so, loss reserve. So uh, on this one, I'm assuming that the they had a bid from the contractor first, and then he writes an estimate. His estimate pretty much matched the contractor's estimate. It wasn't that the contractor matched his estimate. He said, uh, it was a good and accurate estimate, but I had to tweak the exactimate criteria in order to get something closer to real-world costs, which – there's a presumption in there that Xactimate is not a real world course. So that's the other thing I want to, I want to touch on a little bit. Yep. And that is Xactimate pricing. Um, again, I've been doing this a long time and I don't think that I've ever really encountered a situation where contractors couldn't do the work and, and, and make money and, and earn a profit with Xactimate pricing. They may have to tweak something, right? Right. Um, here and there, but, it's it, as long as I measured properly, right? And I took everything, the whole, the totality of the claim into consideration, and got everything in there that needed to be in there, right? Um, it's, and this is it goes double, triple, quadruple for daily claims because there's so many more things that have to be in there because you're dealing with right. more than just roof gutters and siding. You've got drywall, framing, flooring, really? you know, on, yeah, on and on and on and on, right? Um, I don't, and I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there, I think that would argue with this, but I personally, and all the claims that I've done have not found Xactimate pricing to be yeah. not real world. And again, it goes back to, I mean, my, how do you handle this? I mean, that, that was one of the questions he asked, you know, I would just respectfully ask whoever questioned him on it, you know, and, and to be respectful about it and, and careful how you word it. Did I write it within guidelines? Yeah. Was there anything I wrote outside of guidelines? You know, I mean, as long as you're writing within guidelines, okay, and you have documentation of what you wrote, then there shouldn't be an issue. The only time it's going to be an issue is if there's no documentation of why you wrote it that way, or B, you you paid for things that you have no documentation of. Okay, right. that's the only time that a situation like that should even be an issue. I mean, you could write a dollar for dollar, you know, as a as a, the contractor wrote it, but as long as you have proof of what you wrote, it shouldn't be an issue. And that yeah. would be the only reason why I would think a carrier would ever question you is if you can't prove up what you wrote. Exactly. So, and again, the more I read this question, he's the, the, the presumption that exactimate pricing is not real world. He goes, he's saying to rephrase accurate estimates, increase in I, I's fee tiers, um, those estimates would be a bit subjective and therefore cost more to, more compared to the base level objective exactimate pricing that we all know can be a bit low. Well, we don't all know that. That's a presumption. Um, when they when and then the next thing is when a contractor tells the carrier the actual cost, assuming that we're not giving the actual cost up front, that we're right. we're undercutting or not paying what we owe up front. Um, then he's he's talking about you know how the the IA gets paid. He's it's, the assumption here is that. We're not paying as much up front because the insurance company wants to save money on our fee bill and right. on the claim somehow, um, which yes. I don't think either one of those things are true. I don't think that's accurate. They don't want to pay claims at all. That's a fact. Right. But I mean, why would you want to? Right. But they're bound to pay customer and reasonable prices. And because they have to, they want to go ahead and do it properly they want because to do it properly. the penalties for not doing it properly are a whole lot heavier than paying it properly. That's correct. Yeah. So, so if you don't pay this properly, so. Um, Going back and forth on a like, little bit of an estimate, you know, uh, increase in fee tiers and things like that. The problem is, is that when claims have to go into supplements, they run a high risk of going far, a lot farther than that. And even into litigation, which we've already established is a fact that the carrier is most likely going to lose. Right. Um, and it's going to cost them way more than, you know, if, if, just to pull a number out of the air, and he didn't say this, but if, if we say that that all first inspection 
first inspections that are written up by uh, independent adjusters are all 10% low on purpose. They're going to pay, in, I mean, 10 times that, 10 times the total amount of that if it go if it ends up going farther than right. just doing a supplement on it. So it doesn't, I, I think it's a good question. And, and it's and basically because there is some conventional wisdom out there and there's, there's, there's a, a bit of a narrative from contra- some contractors and probably all PAs that exactimate pricing is too low. I haven't found that to be the case. Um, and how come these guys are driving around in big old pickup trucks? Yeah, that are wrapped yeah. and everything else, and gym memberships and yeah, steroid. Know, I mean, or body waxing. I mean, yeah, all that uh, supplements. Stuff. I, mean, I meant to on. say supplements, not steroids. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. so they're working off. You know, ninety nine percent of the roofs they do are based off of, you know. First shot, first shot, uh, um, exact to make estimates. Yeah. However, one of the companies that I worked for, they hired a guy that his only job was to take every claim and send in supplements on them. Oh, yeah. That was all he did was just write supplements on everything he could add to a supplement. And it was a numbers game. And uh, some of them would get paid and some of them wouldn't. But he made a percentage off of all that. The company made extra money and this guy made himself money so he was like their internal pa almost yeah it's a it's a business model so, and yeah. and part of that is marketing and that marketing is running around saying that exactimate isn't paying enough yep. that the pricing is low so it's a fact that it's not it's not 95 percent of insurance companies that are using exactimate that's which is you know effectively all of them and basically and people get their roofs replaced every year. And I've used Symbility. Okay. My pricing was no different. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wrote the same claim in both just to see how it would come out. It's the same. So, I mean, within like minuscule difference. Yeah. And not only that, but Xactimate is not written just for the insurance industry. Right. It's not a, or not a software, a tool just for plenty of estimators and contractors use it that have has no involvement with the insurance at all. Right. So... Where do you, how, no, I'm not. Got it. Okay, next. All right, so next, Justin Williams had a ton of questions, and I want to hit all of them at some point, but I, I, right now I want to touch on a couple of these. Hey, hey. Mr. Insured, how's it going? It's going great today. How are you doing? <laughs> okay. right. This is actually... Guy Grant from Veteran Adjusting School. So you want to learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the high-end training center of Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in-depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come ride along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. And by the way, we're not discounting the last guy and anything like that. It's just, there's just things in there we're just not agreeing with. And we're not saying that you're not entitled to feel the way you feel about the situation. There's something that's happened that makes you think that way. But just from our experience, we don't feel that, that what's being presented to us with what limited information we have is accurate. Right. So. And it's, and it's, it is, it is not a true statement to sit here and say that exact main pricing is 100% true, correct all the time. Right. Because it's... Because it's not. It certainly wouldn't be. Everything's fallible. But I think it's exceptions to the rule um, when there's there's a, an error or mistake. And it, it, I like I said before, it does happen. And they will... You'll get a, an email or a phone call or whatever from a manager saying, hey, listen, we got to change some, the pricing on the Xactimate, you know, for whatever this thing is. Yeah. Um, because it's turning out that it's the we you know the the local claims office in this you know medium sized college town knows all of the the local contractors and they all they sat down and had a meeting and said well you know 
we don't feel like we're getting paid enough for this stuff. It's not, it's not enough. And then they agree on some new price. I've seen that happen. So it's not like it's, right. you know, it's, we're not in a vacuum. Let's put it that way. Things right. go on that we don't see. And a lot of the, we're the, we're the low man on the totem pole with the point of the spear, right? We don't know everything else that goes on. So we have to conduct ourselves as much by the rules as possible. And, you know, if something needs to change, I mean, again, pick up the phone and call your manager, right? If you've got a question about something, if you, if you want to try to do something different and write it in the, the diary, you know, yep. explain it. And especially if you get, if you call your manager and they say, yeah, it sounds good. I think I don't have a problem with you paying that extra for that, whatever thing is, put that Do person's name in the it. file. Yep. So spoke to my manager, Bob Ross. Yeah. You know, and he said it was okay to clouds. paint fluffy little clouds. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. So, so, so this next question, Justin Williams, um, again, he's got a bunch of them here, but he wants to kind of talk about, um, what does a typical day look like in the peak time frame of a cat deployment, uh, AKA when the machine is firing out on all cylinders, um, what's the breakdown of a 12 to 16 hour day? How many claims within the day? Uh, does the work day consist of an even balance of drive time, appointment, scoping, grading, et cetera? Um, or is there more time devoted in one, in a day to one particular area? Examples would be helpful, which I think this is a good question because it's, and there's as many answers to this question as there is adjusters and personalities and work styles, but some are more efficient than others. Yeah. So, so it's efficiency, right? So, and, and what is that? What does that really mean? You know, what does it mean to be efficient? So when we, when we look at this, this kind of work and we, we look at the way we get paid, right? So first of all, we have an incentive to, to write the biggest estimate that we can, right? Cause we get paid more for that, but we can only write it for what it is. So it's not that we're like trying to find more things to add in there just to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. We find all the things that are there that we ha we can pay for without missing any. And then that's what we get paid for, but we don't get paid by the hour, right? So it's not, time based well, there are like, some models now that are going to that but there are and we can yeah, we can we'll jump discuss into that. that later um but on the traditional you know way we get paid is which is essentially a commission um we're getting paid per claim so if you close three claims in a day you're going to get paid for three claims right if you close nine claims in a day you're going to get paid for nine claims the problem with trying to close more claims is that you're looking at a longer day and you're looking at, if you're going, trying to go too fast and you don't have a good, a really good system, Bless you. Thank you. then you're going to spin out, right? Your, your quality is going to be terrible and red flags and phones are going to start ringing. Right. And that's when you start getting in trouble. People who try to go too fast, inevitably there's a, there's a wipeout. Go faster than their skill level they're faster than their skill level, right? So you want to go as fast as your skill level. You want to push yourself a little bit because, you know, it's growth, whatever. Yep. Um, but at the same time, um, because the, the, where the efficiency thing comes in is that we're basically getting paid on project based, right? So if you, if you take on a, a project and you can get it done in less time, then you're more efficient, right? And my whole thing with all this is, is that it's not because I'm, working faster, like I'm typing faster, I'm writing faster, I'm walking faster or whatever. It's because I'm just taking less time to do each piece of that, right? So let's take, for example, scoping a house. If I don't have a system for scoping a house and I just like, like I look at the backside of the house, the insurance drag, take, drags me around to the backside of the house, take a look at the deck. And then I say, all right, well, I'm gonna take one well, back here, I'm gonna take a look at the left side of the house too. And then I'm gonna go look at the roof and I'm gonna come back down and look at the front and the right. You're gonna miss stuff. Right. You're, well, yeah, so you're gonna miss stuff, plus you're gonna waste time, yep. right? So you're, you're backtracking, you're going in all the different directions, right? So if being more efficient doesn't mean that I'm gonna do that, like run or jog doing that, it's that I'm gonna do that in a way that eliminates or reduces backtracking as much as possible, so I'm not walking, because walking from one corner of the house to the other corner of the house takes, you know, I don't know, 27 seconds or something like that, but if you keep going back and forth and you're, you know, 
if you're not measure if you if you walk over here and then you walk back over there for something and then you measure over to here and then you you're doing that five right. times 27 30 seconds times five is you know it starts to add up in the minutes and you do that if they have two outbuildings they have interior they've got a roof if you go up on the roof and this is roof is probably the, the biggest one for people or one of the biggest ones if you get up on the roof and then you're like all right well i'm gonna walk up to the top of the roof and i'm gonna look around I'll get my overview shots and you just spin in a circle and take pictures. And then you pick the, the, the slope with the most damage and you go to that slope and start scoping. Then you're, you know, then you, then you go back to the front and you scope and then you go over to here and scope and you go over there and scope. And, oh wait, I forgot to get, now I'm going to get the, how many events are on this thing again? And you're, and you, so you're going, you're all over the, the roof back and forth 20 times when what you should have done was when you got to the house, ensure it says, Hey, you know, I got damage to the back, to the deck. Um, I think, can I show it to you real quick? And it may, yeah, it's, okay, fine. Take a look at it. He may have to go to work and he wants to show you that thing real quick. And then I'm not scoping the deck until I get right. to the deck, right? And I'll go back there and look at it and say, okay, yeah, I definitely see the deck is smashed. The tree's laying on it. looks like your grill's damaged. looks like that's damaged. looks like that's damaged. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm going to go to jump up on the roof now. And then I'm going to do my scope and I'm going to do it in a systematic way. Yep. Come down. Work around the house. I get back around to the deck. There, I'm scoping the deck. I'm taking pictures and everything. I get, you know, pictures of the grill and whatever. And then I'm, I finish the house, and they go to the L building, right? I'm not backtracking. I'm not going back and forth. I'm not going up and down and over and this way. All these different ways. So that's a long-winded way of saying I'm getting paid as a, as a property adjuster to be as efficient as possible to have an incentive to maximize my movements on a property, right? And it yep. goes goes for working through Xactimate, how I move through that software, the things I say to the homeowner, when I say them, um, all of those things, they all contribute to compacting the amount of time I spend on that claim as much as possible without going like running and trying to race through it because that's when mistakes start to happen and you miss things. And then that way, quality stays high, the customer service stays high, and my production yep. stays high. So that... I have a root, an absolute routine that I do on everything I do, whether I'm doing property, whether I'm doing automobiles, whether I'm doing semi trucks and trailers, whatever it is I'm doing, I have a process for each one of those things and I do not deviate from it whatsoever because every time I do, I miss something. Something, I mean, it doesn't matter how minor it is. If I allow the, the contractor, the homeowner, the shop, wherever I'm at, if I allow them to control my actions, yeah. That I'm going to miss something. I'm going to have bigger. I'm going to have supplements or bigger supplements, or I'm going to have to come back out and look at stuff. And so I just respectfully, with the second I get there, I'll just say if it's the contractor, I say, "Look, I've got it. You know, this is what I do. Let me get my inspection done. Once I'm done, I'll go over it with you. And if there's anything you want me to see, then we can go over it at that time. And uh, and I do that every single time. Just 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 allow me to do this so I can be as thorough as possible, and then we'll we'll go over it together. And I'll do that with the homeowner. And if the homeowner says, "Well, you know, I've got to go" or something like that, then I'll I'll make that, you know, I'll make that. Take a minute. You know, yeah, I'll go do that. Make the note. Okay, again, don't scope it, but I'll acknowledge it. What they want to acknowledge what they wanted me to see. Make sure I have that included. But I'll go back to my routine, and I will f start to finish that routine every single yeah. time, and. And I can tell you the only claims that I ever have headaches on are the ones that I came out of my routine. Yep. yep. You know, I'm not saying I'm perfect, you know, but I guarantee you those are the only ones that I have mistakes on. Yep. And that's, and a lot of things can pull you out of your routine. So, yep. you know, there's, there's a common misconception that multitasking is a valuable skill. I strongly disagree. Yep. Um, I will work on one thing at a time. And try to eliminate all distractions as much as possible. And some, sometimes it's hard to do when you're at somebody's house. An example is if I am in the middle of a scope, then my phone's either in the truck or it's in my back pocket with the ringer off. I'm not answering the phone. If I'm writing estimates, I'm not answering my phone, right? Because okay. the second I stop what I'm doing, walking around the house, taking pictures and measuring, you know, writing stuff down, and I put my things away and I pull my phone out. And then I immediately switch out of the task I was in yep. into whatever this guy wants, right? So then my brain jumps onto this track over here with this guy, and I may have to walk over to the truck and pull his file out. I'm I just I'm dead in the water 
on this scope, right? So a, a scope that would have taken me 30 minutes, now it takes me that yep. plus the amount of time I took to deal with this phone call. If it was the, the only phone call I got, which if I'm answering the phone every time it rings, it's not going to be. Right. And then whatever it took for me to get back into my group, where was I? I think I was on the back side of the house. I mean, it's literally, it's, it just, it kills momentum. It, it's guys wonder why they can't do more than three or four claims a day, but this is why, because yep. they're answering the phone voicemail. Let, let the, let the modern technology or 1970s technology help you out here. Yep. Let it go to voicemail. So to kind of touch on what this guy was asking, um, you know, on a typical day, typical day. So, you know, yeah, so I, I'm I'm not gonna do like a like a full breakdown necessarily, but you want to block off things, right? So you want to block off, um, like you maybe I will. Let's go ahead and do a typical day, right? So if 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 you are motivated and you don't stay up till one o'clock in the morning every night, then you can get up at four thirty or five o'clock in the morning or five thirty, and make yourself a pot of coffee or walk down, shuffle down to the the lobby at the hotel and grab yourself some, you know, nasty coffee from down there. They might have a little coffee maker in the room and that's nobody else is up. And if they are, they're not answering their phone. I wouldn't be, I'm going to sit there. I'm going to do corrections and I'm going to write any estimates that I didn't, didn't do yesterday. I'm going to check work email and there's not going to be any voicemail because I took, took, took care of those the day before. And I'm going to write all that stuff up. I'm going to, any claim that has something I can do on it, I'm going to do it at that time. And then once it's time to start making phone calls, eight o'clock in the morning, then I'm going to start making calls if I don't, if I'm not in the field. Right. So if I, if I, if I did a couple of corrections and they resulted in a change in the price, the, the, the estimate total, then I have to call those people back. Right. So I may finish all that work up and then go jump in the truck and do my appointments. Like I'll do four in the morning and then take a lunch break. Like a, I don't take a lunch break. <laughs> well, let me, let me reclassify what I do. Stop at around lunchish time, run through a drive through or get, get something out of my bag, you know, some tacos or something like that. And then Everybody I'm love tacos. To, you don't love tacos. Everybody love tacos. Oh, okay, yeah, of course. Um, I was getting phone calls all morning. Right. And I have a couple to make because I had those two corrections from earlier. Cause that, and you know, so I got to call those people that's when I make my calls, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to sit down with my voicemail. I'm going to write all the, every, every voicemail down. And a lot of them, you don't have to call them back. Hey, Matt, I got your message about coming tomorrow at, t at 10 o'clock. That's fine. We'll be here. We'll see you then. You don't need to call us back. I'm not calling. Why would I call that guy back? If I answered that call when he called, then I'm, I might talk to that guy for 10 minutes about nothing. Right. right. So I'm wasting time when I could have just let my voicemail take it. So I write down all my voicemails. I mark, I put a mark or some, of some kind next to the ones I need to call back right now. I have the, the other two that I need to call back with the totals, the new totals. And then I can make all those calls, right? And then I jump into Xactimate and update those activity diaries. And then I go and do the rest of my afternoon. Another three three claims or maybe four claims. Depending, if the middle of the summer, the sun right. comes up at five o'clock in the morning and it goes down at, you know, 10, you can you can squeeze some extra. If, if a person will let you at their house, I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna go. Right. But, you know, I'm not gonna be there at ten o'clock at night, but it's it's if the, if there's enough sun to see and it's good sun, so that I'm not gonna create work for myself later with but the the supplement or reinspection, I'm gonna try and be on the roof. And I write them up on site. Not everybody does that. Most people don't do that. Um, I would say before you leave a house, always put the photos in and label the photos. Because if you miss photos. That's one reason you get the file kicked back. You don't have the risk photo in there, right? Or right. There's no pictures of the out. You don't have an overview shot of the outbuilding. We got to have that. It's got to be in the file. You've got to jump in your car and drive. You know, hopefully you're in that neighborhood. You can swing by and grab the photo, and you got to reopen it and exact me. Put the the picture in, and then close it, and do all the documents, and then send it back up. Ten minutes of, of your day wasted. If you keep doing that, that adds up, right? It adds up and adds up and adds up. So if you want to close seven claims a day or nine claims a day or eight claims a day, it's, it has, this is, it's, it is art and science. So what I do, the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I status my claims. 
Those, that's the first thing I do is I go through my claims, make sure they've been updated in status. That's the first thing I do in the morning. I status, I status twice a day sometimes just to make sure that I made sure I did it properly, you know, got yeah. to it. But I'll status in the morning. Uh, so to stop you right there, yeah. you, like on the auto side, I don't know what that means, the status. Does that mean like you put an actual note in saying something? Or is so like a auto is a little bit different. Um, so number one is if you've already set the appointment, you know, um, and you're just waiting for that appointment to arise. Most of the time with, with auto claims, you're going to do that appointment within the first 24 to 48 hours after receiving the claim. Um, but like on a cat, I'll sit down, I'll get my big group of claims and I'll, and I'll set all my appointments and I've got all my appointments set and I put them in and I status them as the date and time of the appointment. Okay. Technically I really don't have to touch that claim again until I actually go inspect it. Okay. However, I will still go through my claims and say, I just reiterate what I've already done appointment set for this date. Because what happens is, especially if, let's say if you have a claim that's set out for more, more than 72 hours from the date, yeah, a red flag is going to go off somewhere that this claim has not been statused in more than 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever right. it is. And you need to provide information. Okay. That happens on the property side and it's like seven days though. Right. And so, and, and, and different carriers and different IA firms have different criteria. But what I'm doing is I'm just trying to avoid getting those, those little nasty you know, reminder emails going, Hey, what's going on with this? Whenever, obviously you can, if you actually open it up and looked at it, you can see that the appointment is set for two days from now, but just to stop, stop right. that from happening is I just go in there and I'll just cut and paste the same line. If nothing's changed in it, Yeah, that's just all I will do just every morning, cut paste until the day of the actual appointment that I do it instead of that's, that's just me. What I do on property side. Um, I still status in the morning, you know, I look. I go through each one of them, see what needs to be done, and I will make a note in it. You know where I'm at on that file. Still waiting for this information. Did this or uh, appointment still? You know, uh, still set for this date. You know, and yeah. I, I will just do it. That way, my manager knows that I'm looking at my claims. They see that I'm trying to be efficient, yeah. and they know that they don't have to worry about me. The more you're off the radar, the more you do things that little things like that. They might take you an extra 15 minutes of your day. But it's 15 minutes is all it is of your routine every day. Just go and status all your claims, even if it's the same information every day until it's done. Your managers trust you because they know you're making right decisions yeah. and you're taking care of business and there's nothing to worry about. If you're the guy that, oh, yeah, man, this claim has been sitting there for a few days and they go in, there's no notes on it or anything like that. And they have to pick up the phone and call you, you know, big trouble, big trouble. But, hey, if they see your name pop up on a list, they're going to go. There's probably a reason I'm not going to worry about it. You know, yeah, yeah. so that consistency in what you do is really important. Yeah. But that's what I do is every morning. I status my claims first thing. You know, um, I'm the morning guy that likes to get up and get going. I like to be at the house at eight o'clock in the morning and, and up on that roof. Well, you know what? I got a hard reality of that because it doesn't always work in all parts of the country because some countries are like a lot more humid than others. And <laughs> you try to get on that roof that has algae on it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. do and that condensation up there. And you are going nowhere. So now you set yourself up for failure that day because now you're at a house that has algae roof and condensation on it and dew on it, and you can't do anything until it burns off. Yeah, yeah. Wood shake is notorious for that. And so now you're now either you need to reschedule and come back later so you don't screw up your appointments later, or you have to get on the phone to your next appointment and go, I'm probably going to be late, and they probably need to call the next two appointments because you're not going to get caught up. Yeah. You know, so I learned that the hard way. So I try not to get out and start inspecting roofs now until, and this is me, and it depends on where you're at. Um, I'm trying not to get to those roofs till after 9.30 when I know, yeah. no, 9.30, 10 o'clock till I know that the, uh, the dues are going to be burned off on it. And I will spend the rest of my time doing my admin stuff, catching up on claims, um, doing my corrections, you know, that sort of thing. And hey, if I've been really good lately, guess what? Now I've got like a, and I don't have any corrections and all my stuff is done i've got between like 7 30 and 9 30 to go do whatever it is i want to do go have a nice breakfast go to the gym you know go fish a little bit yeah. find a pond before i get over there which i've done that a lot where i've hey look i've now got an hour and a half to kill you know <laughs> and i will just go you know just do what i want to yeah. and then and then i'll start my day but because now i'm getting on roost later that means i'm working later in the day you know i'm, I'm going to work even longer so yeah i used to 
have all my stuff done at a reasonable hour. And we're saying no later. I was never in the field past five thirty, six o'clock, you know, and because I've kind of shifted myself because of trying to make sure I don't get the slippery roof. I'm out till probably six or seven now, you know, yeah. but it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to do it that way because I'm actually more efficient now. Yeah. And I, and then at the end of the day, returning phone calls, that's always the last thing. I, I mean, that's my first thing I do when I get in is the first thing I do is go through all my voicemails, check on my phone calls, you know, return the phone calls that need to return, you know, check, check file notes and see if anybody has sent something to me, whether you're a project manager or whoever, and, and address those issues um, that evening. Yeah. That way, when they get up the next morning and they look through their stuff or they're working late, you're like, hey, look, James handled it. You know? Yep, yep. Uh, and, and I can't stress enough. I mean, and you know this. And just communicate. Just status, status, status. I mean, the more you status, the less you will hear from anybody. Yep. That's true. If you're interested in getting the absolute best property claims training available, then I want to tell you about my friends over at Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster with a focus on catastrophe property adjusting. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you're ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you have to get some training somewhere. But Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, as well as its continuing support and mentorship for graduates long after students become working adjusters. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if Voss is the right choice for you. Adjustertv.com slash VAS. Remember, I'm a people person that doesn't like people and I want my phone ringing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So... Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, he's kind of in the spirit of his question. Um, he was kind of wanting to know like the, the thick of things when you're like at the highest, at the peak of production, you have to be, you, your time is, is, is you have to have pre precision scheduling. Right. So, yep. you know, when I say, you know, I'm, I, if I get up in the, in the morning and I do some corrections or whatever, it's because they came in late. If, if they came in at a reason, if they came in before I was out of the field, I'm correcting, making corrections that night. I'm going to take care of that stuff before I go to bed, but I'm going to have a hard shut off, right? Cause sleep is super important when you're on cat. Um, if it's a brand new person, you have to have the expectation that you're going to work 16 hour days at least. And you're going to be until you get your routine down until you get your routine down. Yeah. And so you're going to be up till midnight one, two, and you're going to be getting up at four five, six. You're not going to get a whole lot of sleep the first week. So kind of the way once you get your routine down, it probably might take two or three cats to get there is you are, it's hot and heavy for the first week, maybe two weeks, yep. depends on the storm. Um, you gotta, you gotta slide in some paper days or admin days in there where you, you have a buffer and just in case there's weather, you know, that keeps you from getting on roofs. So you can slide people over to this day. So they're not having to wait two weeks in order to get right. So you've got, you've got some right. safety net there. But the thing is, is that once the claims volume starts to drop off and this on a, it's on wind and anything really other than hail, it, it's going to drop off almost immediately because you're going to mm -hmm. get the claims, most of the claims that you get. And then if you're staying, you're going to do cleanup most right. of the time. Um, or you're going to get claims transferred to you from somebody who, washed out right right which is fun yeah so and that on hurricanes that is anybody who's listening to this who has been on a hurricane and stayed on a hurricane longer than two weeks has gotten claims from other people who got kicked off the storm or who yep. left but with hail i was getting that by the second week yeah exactly so on hail you are you, there's a big pile of them that come in at first and then it starts to, it slowly tapers off right so there comes a point to where, you know, in the first two weeks or first three weeks, you're doing that, those 16 hour days, you're just, and you, but you, but you know, having, once you have experience, you know, that if you can keep up with all that work and they keep giving you more claims and keep piling them on you, that that's like the bulk of, that's a big, big chunk of what you're going to get out of that storm. So you want to like maximize that as much as possible. As it starts to taper off, then you start to get to the point to where you start getting caught up with incoming claims and my you know my buddies and i that but 
been doing this for a long time together. Um, back in the day, we called it riding the wave, yep. right? It's like you're surfing on it because you you're you're inspected to closed. You're 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 caught up closed right. at the end of every day, right? So if if you have five pending claims on Tuesday, at the end of the day, those cl- those claims are done, right? And then the next more that night or the next morning or whatever, you get four more, and then you do those. I call I'm gonna call I'm gonna do them that that day. I'll call them in the morning. And say I'll be there in two hours. Right. And I'll get those knocked out. And then the next day you get two and then the next, and then you go for the weekend and you get the weekend off. Right. So then you fly home. And then on Monday, maybe it was after the 4th of July or some big party weekend or something like that. And everybody was talking over the fences Mm -hmm. in town where you're doing the storm. And then you get 27 new claims on Monday. So obviously you're not closing all those in one day. Right. Um, So you, so then you get caught up on those real fast and then you're just like to current, to current, to current. And if nothing comes in on a Tuesday, I'm taking Wednesday off. Right? So my deployments where I was doing my field claims, where I was doing field claims versus like even an auto, where I was doing all field claims versus going to a drive, but on my property and auto field claims, man, my first, when I first get there, before I even get there uh, to location, I've already received anywhere from, you know, 30 to 80 claims, you know, before I get there. And I find myself, you know, multitasking while I'm driving, you know, making phone calls already before I get there, using voice to text technology to update my calendar and things like that and put them in there. I'll pull over for a little while and I'll kind of map everything, you know, and I'll try to grab a few of them and get them close together. And then I can call those while I'm driving. And that way I'm ahead of the game a little bit. But I always take the first couple of days when I arrive on location all I do is organize my files, map myself, and make all my phone calls and set it up. Now, after that, all I'm doing is is just I'm just a just a programmed, you know, robot yep. just going through every morning and just going down my list and going hitting my claims and writing my claims those days. And then whenever new stuff comes in, you know, now I've got myself routed every day. And if something pops in within that route, I can throw a couple of them in there you know, and, and be more efficient than that. Or if I have to, I'll throw them at the end. But, and, and that's just constantly rolling. And then you'll sit there and find out, hey, I knocked out, you know, this happens on auto for me quite a bit. I never do less than 10 a day on auto, yeah. but I can do 16 to 20 a day, you know. And so I've had days where I've finished up 11, 12 claims by one o'clock in the afternoon because everything was so close together and it was so easy to do. And, you know, once you get good at hell, on auto, it's just, I mean, 15 minute claims. You got six minutes worth of inspections and 10 minutes worth of writing and you're done, Yeah, you know, yeah. and you're sending it up and you're, you're moving to the next one. But, um, I'm done by, you know, 12, one o'clock, you know, no later than two. And I'm looking at my schedule for the next day, you know, and I'm calling people up. Hey, can I, I'm calling the people that are on the tail end of the day and Hey, can I get you taken care of today? And, and next, you know, you've, now you've created yourself within a few days you've created yourself an entire day off if you want to take it or you're just moving more claims up and once you're moving more you're moving more claims you get more claims exactly. you know and that's how i do mine i'm just always trying to find a way i'll never schedule myself more than 10 11 claims in a day that's the most on, on auto on property is different and there's different expectations depending on who you're working for and what you're doing but um i'll never schedule more than 10 or 11 a day but I will knock out. It's not uncommon for me to hit 16, 20 in a day, yeah. you know, and, and that's when I'm making bacon, you know, on the, on some carriers, you know, so like whatever I went to the hurricane lawyer, I was working, I was working, uh, they didn't want us to do more than so many claims a day. They were trying to limit you. And then they wanted you to take every third day as what they called a paper day or an admin day. And, which was fine. I mean, if that's what they wanted to pay me to do, I mean, I'm w- willing to do it, but I found myself doing more, you know I mean? It was just, you're just, you get to the point where your efficiency is so caught up and you're bored and then they're questioning what you're doing. And, and so now you're just in this routine and you're knocking stuff out. And, you know, I, like I said, I had I was, was 72 or 74 claims is what I was given my first day yeah. where I went to go work. Yeah, Southern Louisiana, for you. you know, and I spent, and I, and in one day I called every one of those people and scheduled every single one of them in one day. Oh man, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> this, one of the most singular, like most amazing feelings when you're on a big cat is having your schedule put together. Everybody's yep. called and they're all documented. 
whenever I came in the next day and I told my manager that I had they go, well, you got people to call. I said, no, I don't. You've already called all those? I've already called them and scheduled them. Yes, I, showed, I did. <laughs> but I showed them my calendar, and they're like going, wow. You know, and in the process. Right told me to do it. And in the process, I closed five claims, you know, over the phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I closed five over the phone during that process. So now I'm looking like a hero, you know. I just got my claims the day before. I closed five, and everything's scheduled. And now I'm five up on my average. You know, to help my daily average oh, as yeah. I'm as I'm moving forward, and I'm looking like a hero. Yep. Yep. So that's the name of the game is how you look. That's right. <laughs> it's not what you pay or say; it's how you. It's how you look. Whoa, Matt just killed his glasses. So I had this one. You had this one. So I had this one. I was uh, it was actually in Overland Park, Kansas. I think it was that same storm. Um, I had. I was calling people and saying, no, nah, you don't need to be there, whatever. So I was doing a lot of inspections where the homeowners went home. This was like 2003, early in my career. So I was like run and gun. Right. And I uh, knocked on the door. I was knocking on the door just to make sure like nobody's there so that they're not freaking out because some dude's climbing on the roof. And I uh, was working my way around the elevations, right? So I walked to the, there's, the gate was on the left side of the house and Open up the gate. It was like a like a picket fence, just like a cedar picket fence, you know, with the gaps in it like that. And I walked straight up to the back corner to get the back overview shot of the house. And then I was going to walk up and finish working on my scope of the back side of the house. And I walked up to the back corner. It was a pretty good sized backyard. Um, and turned around and took my photo of the back side of the house. And I lowered my camera, and there was a beagle on the deck. And he was looking at me. You know, how beagles kind of, yeah. they kind of look like they have like human ish eyes. It's yeah. a little, they're a little freaky. He was yeah. just like looking at me like, and I looked at the gate. The gate was wide open. He looked at the gate. Oh. He looked, I looked back at him. He looked back at me. And at the same time, we both tore across the yard towards the gate. And he beat me out the gate and just went <laughs> down the street with the beagle. You know, ears flop and just running off like, ah, I'm free. And I t I spent a good half an hour chasing that dog, chasing down. That dog down. And the neighbor finally came home and said, hey, Buster, hey, Buster, come here. And like in one second, Comes got the dog. It. So, and that was when I discovered that. Always close the gate behind you. Well, two things. That, number one, or number two, but the first thing is to always rattle the gate before you open it up because I've had other occasions where I've gone in the backyards and get up, you know, walk out to the back corner, turn around take a picture of the house, lower my camera. And there's three dogs and they're running towards me. Right. And they're like bristled up and they're ready to like tear my face off. Always rattle that gate. Because that's what when people come over to the house or kids are coming to the backyard. The dog's going to run around at the gate 99% of the time. I've had times where they haven't, where I've done that you go in the backyard and you know, start scoping around the house, go around the back behind the shed, come out from behind the shed. And there's a golden retriever just sitting there looking at me. Like he just came out and appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, but I've been bitten by a dog twice and not like just barely broke the skin, but it's like dogs, uh, the owner was standing right there. A the dog wasn't freaking out or anything. He just walked around behind me and just went <sighs> around my calf. Just, and I was like, Hey, why? And the guy didn't believe me until I showed him the big welt, but he's like, are you hurt? I mean, this is, is it serious? I it's like no. I wasn't in. I wasn't in insurance at the time, but I had a Doberman. I was walking up to the house with a homeowner, and it was a big, beautiful mansion mm -hmm. in Fort Worth. And uh, they meet me at the sidewalk, open the gate. I'm walking up towards the house, and there's, there's this little Schnauzer and this Doberman. We're just walking up, and all of a sudden, man, Doberman just bites me right at the oh, base of my butt, you know, in the top oh. of the leg. And I moved. I was like, dog just bit me. She goes, he doesn't bite. I said, oh, he just bit me. He's never done that before. Well, he's doing it now. And he's just like, and, and at this point, he's latched onto me. And she's grabbing his collar, trying to trying to pull him off of me. She gets him off of me. He turns around, bites her. I sprint. I, I jump this decorative wrought iron fence with spikes <laughs> on top. I'm out there on the street, drop my pants, you know, look at the back of my leg with flesh out of it. Jeez. You know, well, the dog doesn't bite. I ain't decided he wanted a piece of me that day. Puddles so, yeah, doesn't bite. Yeah. So I had one. I had one where um, I'm looking at this car, 
you know, I'm out looking at this. Uh, I'm sorry, it was an RV. And um, I pull up to the house. And I see this basset hound, you know. And what's a basset hound going to do? Right. <laughs> right. And their legs are this yeah. long. <laughs> you know, and, and so he's real nice. And I rubbed his ears. You know, we got along pretty good. And so then I see this other dog. This dog is like got one white eye and one black eye. And he looks like he's probably part pit bull. Um, looks like a Disney villain. Yeah. He looks like he's like part <laughs> pit bull and part border collie, you know, just you can't figure this dog out. Uh, Australian shepherd years, mix. Like, it's like just dog is just, he's crazy looking. Okay. But he's like, comes over and he's got a stick. I throw the stick for him. You know, me goes and gets the stick, brings it back. I'm inspecting this RV. He nudges me with the stick, you know, I toss the stick again. And so now I got to get up on the roof of the RV. So I toss the stick, figuring he's occupied. I grab the ladder. I'm starting to go up the ladder and all of a sudden chomp right at the ankle, man. He just grabs a hold of me and, uh, and I pull myself up on the ladder and he doesn't have my skin, but he's got my pants leg. And he's hanging off me. I am halfway up the ladder on this RV trying to get away from this dog. <laughs> and he has latched on to my, my, my jeans, and he's not letting go. And he's just shaking his head. While it, and he's hanging on me. And I'm hanging off the back of this RV. Owner's not home. Okay? I'm like going, what am I going to do? You know, this dog, well, finally the dog lets go and drops to the ground. And he goes and gets his stick, and he's... He's wanting me to come back down and throw the stick again. Hey, where do you think you're going, buddy? This, We're playing. So I inspect this roof, and I'm checking out my ankle, you know, and it's falling a little bit. So I climb down, and, you know, I'm, like, looking at the dog, and he's, like, you know, all happy and stuff. Well, the basset hound comes over, grabs the end of the stick. Well, him and the basset hound are, are, you know, fighting over the stick there, and I come down, and I start heading for the truck, and here comes that dog after me with the stick. I stop. He drops the stick. I throw it, and I ran to the truck and got out of there. <laughs> <laughs> but the dog was mad because I wouldn't. Jeez. Because I would not stop playing with them. Man. So, stupid dogs. Anyway, let's see. It's bad James joke time. or Dad joke bingo. Yep. Let's see. Making sure we got... Uh, Pick a joke. Any joke. We've added some to the list now, to the card list. I have here in my hands seven bad James jokes. That one? That's the one. I didn't think he'd pick that one. What did the fish say when it swam into the wall? I don't know. Damn. 